I would like to. I would like to introduce everyone to the session on lesser known invaders of Wisconsin lakes. I'm Ashley Vandyford, and I'll be moderating the session. Before we get started, I want to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. And for anyone wanting to ask questions, the chat box is located at the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions into there and Paul's willing to answer questions throughout the presentation. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Paul Skolinski. He is a Lakes Outreach Specialist with Extension Lakes team at UW Stevens Point and the statewide coordinator of the Wisconsin Citizen Lake Monitoring Network. Paul is also the author of the Field Guide Aquatic Plants of the Upper Midwest, and he teaches aquatic botany at UW Stevens Point. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, as Ashley said, let's keep this more of a discussion. So I'm happy to have people answering or uh, asking questions throughout the presentation. We don't have to hold everything until the end. So if I'm talking about a particular species that you are interested in, go ahead and ask a question in the chat at any time. I have the chat window open and I believe Ashley will as well. So uh, one of us or both of us will see your question and we can, we can use it uh, at any time. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is some of the invasive plants that have shown up a few times in Wisconsin or are knocking on the door in a neighboring state trying to make their way into Wisconsin. And the idea here is that you will get some mental images some familiarity with these species so that if you do see them, we can catch them early. Um, the, the really big benefit of seeing presentations like this is that when you do see one of these things on the landscape, you recognize it, maybe not with the correct name, but you just say, I think I saw that somewhere. I think that's a bad thing. I should take a few pictures of this or something and I should send it to someone and, and get it checked out. And that's really what we need is more eyes on the landscape looking for these potentially problematic species and alerting the proper people uh, to the, the occurrence of that species. So that's what I'll be talking about today and I'll be focusing on the plants. There's a lot of invaders that are animals and plants, diseases and, and many other categories of these invaders. And uh, there's way too much to talk about certainly in one presentation. So I'm gonna be limiting my talk to the plant invaders that we're watching out for here in Wisconsin. All right, so as far as aquatic invasive species in Wisconsin, we have some that are very well established and many of these are probably familiar to you. Eurasian milfoil is a, a, a common one that we've seen in the last uh, 60 years or so throughout Wisconsin. We have curly leaf pondweed, which has been here longer than that. And we have mystery snails that are very common in uh, well over a thousand lakes across the state. But we have many others that are trying to get in. And as I said before, looking for them and spotting them early is really the key to keeping ecological damage to a minimum, keeping financial damage to a minimum. Uh, really, it's, just, it's in the best interest of everyone to find these invaders very early so that we can just get rid of them quickly and easily with minimal expense and damage to the ecosystems. So where do these things come from? They come from, uh, in many cases, water gardens and aquaria. Um, these are released species from uh, captive environments. And in some cases, we see these species also being moved around by boats. That's a common way for Eurasian milfoil and um, curly leaf pondweed to move around between lakes. And some of these uh, new invaders also can move through that pathway, but the water garden and aquaria trade uh, is really the big one that we're talking about here that has brought a lot of these species to Wisconsin or to neighboring states. So let's talk about a familiar face first. Here's the Eurasian milfoil that many of you are familiar with. Some of you may be managing this on your lakes currently. This one has been here in Wisconsin since the 60s, and we have about 850 lakes and streams where it's been documented. There are probably a few more than that that have yet to be documented, and it's just flying under the radar in that, those particular locations. And this one can form dense mats at the water surface. It tends to grow to the surface and then spread laterally, so it creates these 
these webs or networks of vegetation along the surface. And it can really interfere with recreational activities, whether that's boating, swimming, fishing, um, pretty much anything. It doesn't always do that. There are lakes that have had Eurasian milfoil for decades and have never managed it. And they still don't see a lot of problems with it. So it depends on the lake. It depends on the chemistry of the lake and the sediments and the nutrient loading, lots of different things to whether uh, Eurasian milfoil will become a huge issue or not. It's, it's very hard to predict that for a given lake. And this one spreads by small fragments. Like many of our perennial aquatic plants, it spreads very well by fragmentation. Um, flowering is not always a reliable uh, strategy for reproduction in aquatic plants because lake and river flows and lake levels can vary a lot from year to year. And the likelihood of a successful flowering may be uh, less in a given year because of different conditions. So aquatic plants have developed other ways to reproduce instead of just seed. And one of these ways is reproduction by fragments. Eurasian milfoil is a perfect example. Here are two tops of Eurasian milfoil stems that have been cut by maybe a boat prop, maybe a big wave that busted them off. Uh, but you see about six or eight inches here of the, the tops of these two stems. And along the stem, there are these roots popping out the side. These are called adventitious roots. That just means a root that is forming somewhere other than the bottom of the plant where you'd expect it to be. They can form right out of any node on the plant. And that a node is where a leaf attaches to the stem. Any one of those locations can produce new roots. So these fragments can float around until they reach shallow water, the roots dangle down and they find sediment, and then they can take root, pull that plant down a little bit and start a new colony from that fragment right there. The Eurasian milfoil is one that uh, is fairly easy to identify. The milfoils have a very feathery appearance in the leaves and typically uh, the leaves are in whorls or rings of four around the stem. And that's what you see here. Here's a stem that has been cut, just showing the section of the stem that has these four leaves coming off. So you'll likely see a, a ring of four leaves. And each leaf is very highly divided into many leaflets. And the leaves have more than 12 pairs of leaflets. So if you count up one side, you're representing a pair each time. And if you counted all these, you'd get uh, 17, I believe this is the start of 18. So it's clearly more than 12. And that's kind of the magic number that we look for to identify Eurasian milfoil. Another thing you can use is looking at the color of the plants. And in this case, even the density of the plant is quite different between these two species. This was a really convenient uh, photo opportunity that I came across. This is probably 12 years ago now, I think. Um, where Eurasian milfoil on the right was growing right next to northern water milfoil. So every condition is exactly the same, but you can see how these two species are differing from each other. The Eurasian milfoil is much more red, northern milfoil being more greenish. And look at how close to the surface the Eurasian milfoil is and how thick the bush of milfoil is compared to the northern milfoil that is most of it is quite a bit below the surface yet. It's mostly individual stems rather than highly branched stems. So uh, it has a much different appearance and different growth habit between these two species. And again, I can point you toward these leaves on the bottom to see the differences between these two species. The Eurasian milfoil in this case has a whorl of five, but each leaf is divided into a lot of tiny leaflets, more than 12, and on a northern over here on the left, there's again four leaves in a whorl around the stem, but each leaf is divided into fewer than 12. And in this case, it looks like we have about eight. So that's another easy way to identify the species, either the color, the growth habit can be useful sometimes, or the, the leaves. So uh, make sure that everything I say, you remember word for word from here on out, and we'll be all good. Just kidding, of course. You will not remember everything I say. You won't remember every name I talk about. You won't remember every species we covered today. But the point, as I said before, is that 
you've got these pictures in your mind after you see this presentation. Hopefully you just recognize that this is something that I don't think belongs here. I should collect a sample, I should take a picture, and I should send it off to somebody to take a second look. That's really all we're looking for from this presentation. So you don't have to remember where these species came from or how many lakes have them. Um, some of these other details are just for informational purposes right now. They're not necessarily uh, super important for you to remember after today. So here's the first one we'll talk about. This is related to that Eurasian water milfoil. This is called parrot feather. It's in the same genus as the Eurasian milfoil and the Myriophyllum genus, which means many leaves. And it refers to the highly dissected leaves uh, of these different species. And here in this bottom photo, you can see that these lower leaves when they're in the water, look very much like a Eurasian milfoil. They are highly divided, very delicate, uh, dissected into many small leaflets. And then as it pops out of the water, it takes on a completely different form. And our native milfoils really don't do this. They have sometimes a flower stalk that sticks above the water, and they may have some little leafy bracts on there. But this one really has these this very uh, airy appearance with these long leaves and a much different appearance than any other milfoil that you'd likely come across in Wisconsin. So the emergent leaves are a little bit less divided, but again, still really feathery and they're very waxy and thick. And this reduces water loss in the plants. Since now it's, it's actually above the water, it has to think about how much water that plant is going to lose from the sun, from the heat, from the wind. And that's a problem that aquatic plants usually don't have to worry about because they are in the water, they're bathed in water. They don't have to worry about water supply at any point. But now they have to think about it a little bit when it pops out of the water. And you can see the little flowers here in the axles. Uh, the axle is, again, similar to a node. It's where the, the leaf is attaching to the stem. So these little fluffy white circles here, those are the flowers. And this is a prohibited species in Wisconsin. It used to be sold widely at pet stores for, uh, for actually using in an aquarium without a lid on it, uh, letting it actually emerge out of the water, or using in water gardens, in small ponds, backyard water features, things like that. So it used to be pretty widely sold. Now it is not. Prohibited means that it is illegal to trade, to purchase, to possess in Wisconsin. So uh, retailers generally do not stock this anymore, and it is illegal to ship into Wisconsin from uh, outside the state as well. Here's a picture of it out on Pool 5 of the Mississippi River. I think this was in 2013. Uh, we were out there looking for the water lettuce and water hyacinth that had been reported out there, and you can see the lettuce here and the hyacinth over here. We'll talk about more uh, in more depth about those two species in a minute here. But then the parrot feather colony here right in the center. And this was actually two stems of parrot feather that just continued growing horizontally along the surface and popping up branches. And these are actually the branches of those stems. So we were actually able to just grab it by the end by these two stems and reel the whole thing in and just pull the entire clump out without having to worry about doing an herbicide treatment or anything like that. We just pulled them all out. And as long as you do it gently and things didn't break off, we just removed the entire population by just, just pulling it in. Um, parrot feather, the reason why we did that is because parrot feather is known to be very difficult to treat with herbicides. So if it does get out of control, it has that very waxy uh, habit to the emergent vegetation and it's so waxy and so lightweight that it will first of all repel any liquid herbicide that's sprayed on it and if that liquid is is able to stick to it well enough the plant itself is so light that it tends to fall over and dunk into the water and, and more or less rinse itself off and eventually it will pop back up and, and stand upright again. But it's a very difficult species to manage if it requires herbicides. So we didn't want to go that route. We just decided, hey, it looks like these are just two lines of plants. It's probably side branches. Let's just pull it in and get rid of it. So there are no populations known from Wisconsin at this time. 
There were a few other populations found, the Pool 5 one that I just showed, and also I think in two locations in Dane County several years ago. But at the current time, we don't know of any populations existing in the state at this time. The next one is Carolina fanwort. This also looks kind of like a milfoil. It's, it's quite divided, but what you'll notice right away is that the leaves are not in whorls or rings of four or five, it's two. They are opposite leaves. There's one coming off the left and one coming off the right. And they're held by these little stalks on each side. So the, the leaves are kind of separated from each other a little bit. So that's the one big thing that would separate this from a milfoil. And then, of course, the flower is much different also. Milfoils have large spikes that are several inches tall that stick above the water. Fanwort has an individual flower that's it's more of a, the flower you'd expect or be used to seeing. It's more of a traditional flower shape, six petals, some stamens in the middle with a, a yellow cast to them. And these flowers are probably uh maybe a half inch across so they're they're pretty small but definitely visible if you were to see a bunch of these flowering um it does have small floating leaves you can see one right here they are really small they're they're kind of elliptical and they have that waxy appearance that the parrot feather or really any emergent aquatic plant has it tends to be a, quite a, a waxy surface on it this is another prohibited species same story as the parrot feather. It used to be widely sold. It was a very popular plant for aquarium use, which means that it certainly could still be out there in aquariums. It's not being sold anymore in Wisconsin, but there could be hundreds of people out there around the state or more that still have fanwort surviving in their fish tank, and it could be released into a local water body at any time. Uh, it's impossible for us to know who has these uh, that purchased them maybe a decade ago and still is cultivating them in aquariums or water gardens. So I'm sure they're still out there and that's why we need to be on the watch for these different species. No existing populations in Wisconsin right now. We've never found it in a wild lake in Wisconsin, although it is well established in several lakes in a, a large chain of lakes in lower Michigan. So it's out there, it can move by fragmentation. So it could be, get moved on a boat trailer from Michigan to Wisconsin over the course of a, a night. Um, so it's possible. And as I said, there are probably still aquariums out there that have this plant in there. So it could still show up at any time. It looks kind of like this species here. This is the water marigold. This is a native species. And what you notice right away about the leaf here is that it basically is in a ring or a, a whirl around the stem. It does not have those two distinct leaves that are separated by those little stalks. Now I'll go back just so you can see that, that picture again on the fan ward. See how the, the leaves are in pairs. There's one on the left, one on the right, and they're kind of pushed apart from each other by those stalks. On a water marigold, that is not the case. They're basically just all the way around the stem without any stalks separating them. And the emergent leaves, if you do see any, they are heavily serrated, so they have large teeth on them. It's not that smooth little elliptical shape that a fanwort leaf would have. And the flowers are yellow. They're not the, the white flowers with the six petals. This is actually an aquatic aster. It's our only aquatic aster. Uh, it has a very large flower. This is probably the size of a uh, half dollar. So quite big, inch, inch and a half across and they're yellow with many, many petals. Sometimes these might have 10 or 12 or, or more petals on them. And it looks like a daisy or an aster. It is in that family. You will likely see this one. Um, it's pretty common in Northwest Wisconsin, so it's probably out there somewhere in your lake. Um, but if you see something that looks like this, just take a look at the leaves there and just make sure that they are in rings rather than being separated by two long stalks. All right, the next one is Brazilian waterweed. And this, again, is kind of the similar story as the parrot feather and the fanwort. This is a really common, or was a really common species for aquarium use and water garden use. It was sold as an oxygenator plant. Uh, I guess it is, but most aquatic plants are, so it's not like it's really that special. 
but it does grow very fast and it photosynthesizes very quickly because of its growth rate and its, its efficiency. So it was used as a plant that produced oxygen in ponds and in aquariums, um, but it grows very, very quickly and would tend to overtake the aquarium or the water garden. And then people would take some of it out. They would do a thinning and take that vegetation and then sometimes dump it into a local lake or river. And that's, that's how it gets around. So it's another species that can survive by fragmentation. Any little piece where there's a node, wherever there's a leaf attaching to the stem, that can start a new plant. What you're looking for with this species is a very large size. Here's the nickel. So you can see these, these plants can be quite large. They can be several times the diameter of a nickel. And they have at least four leaves in whorls or in rings around the stem. So here's four, here's four, here's one with seven. The flowers you will hardly ever see, even if they are flowering, they're not really that conspicuous. They are floating at the surface, but they're still pretty small. Um, maybe a big one would be the size of a dime. So they're still pretty small. Um, and again, prohibited species in Wisconsin. You cannot sell it. You cannot buy it. You cannot possess this species in Wisconsin. It is illegal to do any of those things. Here's a picture from the Portage County uh, population. It's the only population that we've had in Wisconsin. This was back, I think, in 2009. Uh, in a private pond, somebody ordered water lilies for his private pond, and there were other species that were basically contaminants on the water lily rootstock that he purchased. So he planted the water lilies and inadvertently planted propagules of other stuff. And the Bra Brazilian water weed was probably in there as a small fragment, and one little fragment turned into a larger plant. That one fragmented, created more plants. And eventually there, there was a large corner of this guy's pond that was full of Brazilian water weed, probably all clones of one individual that was intent, or unintentionally planted along with those water lilies. So you can see how large this is on my hand here. Uh, we did a couple of rake tosses out there just to see, we pull a rake in, how much of this is Bra Brazilian water weed? Pretty much all of it was, uh, but it's a very large plant compared to other things that would look like that in Wisconsin, they would tend to be much smaller. So again, we had a population in Portage County. It was the only population known. We don't have any existing populations known from the state. That lake did a little bit of the hand removal and then they did a, or that, that pond. Then they did a couple of herbicide treatments to get rid of it. And it's been gone ever since. Now, another one that looks like that is hydrilla. Hydrilla is in the same family as the Brazilian waterweed, has a similar appearance. It tends to be a little bit smaller. You can see here it's about the diameter of a nickel and also has those leaves and rings or whorls of four or more. And they are serrate on the edges. You can see on this lower leaf here, it's got these teeth along the outside. Brazilian waterweed will also have that. And the difference between those two species is this, this one will have teeth under the mid vein as well. The mid vein is this line right down the center of each leaf, um, a primary vein that runs through from the base of the leaf to the tip. And underneath that, there would be teeth on there as well. Not really terribly important for most people to know whether it's a, a hydrilla or Brazilian waterweed. But if you wanted to distinguish those two, that's how you would do it. What you're really concerned about is Am I seeing a species that has whorls of these leaves that have serrations on the side and I have more than four in a, in a whorl or a ring? That is what you're concerned about. If it's less than four, then it's one of the native species that I'll, I'll talk about here in a second. But again, what you're really looking for, large size would be a problem, serrated leaves or rings of at least four those would probably be these two prohibited species, the hydrilla and Brazilian waterweed. Uh, also pictured here is a tuber. The native species that look similar to this do not produce tubers in the sediment. These are like tiny potatoes. They're starch reserves for the plant to uh, come back the following year. They put energy away underground and they re-sprout the following season. Hydrilla produces these tubers. 
the native species that look like this do not, and Brazilian water weed also does not. Um, but if you see the tubers, then that's that's a problem. It's hydrilla, and we need to know about it as soon as possible. Again, no existing populations known from the state. We had one population in Marinette County in 2009, and it is a prohibited species at the current time. So now this one is native. Common waterweed is a native species. There's another waterweed, the slender waterweed. Looks very similar to this, except it's a little bit more delicate. But either way, what you're expecting to see with one of these natives is that it will be about the size of a nickel or less, and it will have a ring or a whirl of leaves around the stem of three or sometimes two, sometimes like very rarely four, um, but pretty much always three. And that's what you're looking for. If you also look closely at this, at any of these leaves, you'll see that they are not serrated. Um, so that's what you're looking for. You want to see a plant that is less than the diameter of a nickel, has three leaves in a whorl, and has no serrations on the leaf. All right, I'll pause for a second just in case there are any questions about anything that I've talked about so far. And then I'll move to a few more. All right, hearing no questions, we'll move on to water hyacinth. <clears throat> this is another species that was sold widely for water garden use in particular, not really used in aquariums because it is so aggressive and so big that it would overtake an aquarium in no time. <clears throat> but it was very common to see in water gardens. It has a floating cluster of leaves with inflated bases. That means uh, you can see in this example right here, in the upper right of that shot, there is a large leaf that is held above water, and there is this inflated base of the leaf here. So basically the stalk of the leaf or the stem of the leaf is inflated into a ball of these very large airy cells. So it contains air, they're very low density, they're very buoyant, and it keeps the plant very high up in the water column. The leaves themselves are like big sails, so they catch the wind. And as a plant gets larger and larger, these clusters get larger, the sails or the leaves start to catch a lot of wind and it causes them to break apart. And then one piece of the cluster floats away to some other location in the lake and they basically all disperse and they create new populations in different areas of the lake. That's the primary way that this one will move around an individual lake. It can also be transported as a fragment if, if one of those small pieces of the cluster was picked up on a, a boat trailer, for example, and moved to a nearby lake, it would also be able to colonize that next lake and start a new population there. The flowers are really showy. This is why it was used quite a bit in water gardening, because the flowers are quite attractive. They are related to pickerel weed, if you have that species on your lake. Uh, the flower looks quite similar to a uh, pickerel weed flower, just a little bit bigger, a little bit lighter in color. Um, and underneath the plant, it also has these very large purple roots. They can hang down several feet into the water and they take nutrients right out of the water rather than being rooted. So it's another reason why people would put them in water gardens is because they have these long roots that would absorb nutrients and they would, uh, they were considered in the category of algae busters by some of these retailers because they were sold with the understanding that if you put this plant into the water garden, it will compete with algae because it is not only shading the water, but also competing for the algae for nutrient, uh, nutrient concentrations in the water. And as I said, this one was previously sold very widely. It still may be out there and could be released into a lake at any time. Um, it is a prohibited species here in the state. It is one that we are not expected to see over winter in Wisconsin. Uh, it is actually, I believe, a zone nine species. And zone nine means that 
the suitable habitat in the US would be like Georgia, Florida, uh, the Gulf Coast states, Texas, Arizona, that kind of uh, section of the country. But as Kathy Techman showed just a little while ago, those USDA plant hardiness maps are moving. And so a zone nine a decade ago is not a zone nine anymore. The, the zone nine area of the country is quite a bit further north than it used to be. And these zones are continuing to move northward. We have seen water hyacinths show up in the same location for multiple years in a row, several times now in Wisconsin. And so the question is out there, is this plant actually is surviving here or is it being reintroduced into the same location every year? And it's a good question. Um, this population here is in Lake Winnicani, part of the Winnebago system. And we have found a lot of this plant in many areas of the lake every year, uh, although not last year, I don't believe it was ever found. But we would remove everything. We'd have a whole crew of, of six or eight or 10 people out there from different organizations. We'd go out in kayaks and small boats and we would find all these, remove all of them, and then next year it's there again. So we don't know what was happening exactly, but it was interesting that in all these same locations around this very large lake, the plant was there every year. So we don't know what's going on, if it's finding some groundwater fed areas maybe, or uh, there was a location that was near a wastewater treatment plant where warm discharge water was entering a wetland area and uh, the plant was able to survive there over the winter, we think, because the water was artificially warm throughout the year and it was allowing it to not freeze out. So it's one that we're out, on, we're on the watch for and we're kind of undecided whether it would actually take care of itself or if the winters here would take care of it on its own or if it's uh, something that can actually survive here through the year. This is a picture of it over on pool five of the Mississippi again, where I showed the parrot feather. So a couple plants in this photo are water lettuce, which I'll talk about also. But these ones here are the lettuce and then up in the very top, that's water lettuce. Most of these very glossy ones are the water hyacinth. So here's the known distribution. We've had a bunch of locations uh, in Washington County where it was dumped into some drainage ditches and roadside ditch type habitats. Um, Lake Winnicani and Lake Butamore here uh, in the Winnebago system, Pool 5 of the Mississippi, and then this one was the wastewater treatment plant in Northwest Wisconsin. All right, so this one is native wild calla lily. The calla lilies are uh, ones that a lot of people don't realize are native here. Uh, a lot of people seem to be most familiar, familiar with calla as uh, a depiction in an, a piece of art. It's very common in paintings and um, sculptures and things like that. It's a, a very unique flower and it is a native species to Wisconsin, fairly common in Northwest Wisconsin, really throughout the Northern half of the state. Wherever there's a, a peaty area, if there's a tamarack marsh or a, a bog or a fen, it's pretty common to find calla growing right on the very edge of the water and growing out a couple of feet as a floating plant out into the water, but anchored to the shoreline. So it is anchored to the shore, as I just said, water hyacinth is not, it is a floating cluster. The leaves look very similar to calla, but calla leaves do not have the inflated base. They are not free floating. And the flower is obviously much different. It's not those showy lavender colored flowers. It is a little spike of flowers with a white hood around it. So quite a different design to the flower and some, some subtle differences in the leaves. But realize that this one is out there. Um, I should say, whenever you see something that you think might be one of these species I talked about, it's totally fine if you send a picture or a sample to someone, to the DNR, to your local AIS coordinator, whoever, if it is not that invasive species, we are very happy that it's not. So don't feel bad if you collect a piece of calla and send it in and say, I'm a little worried this might be water hyacinth. We're delighted if it's not water hyacinth. So um, please do 
collect samples or uh, photographs of anything that's suspicious and just have it double checked. And we're happy to do that. I am happy to take pictures of anything you want to send me. Uh, it doesn't destroy anything. So it's, it's nice if you're worried about picking a flower or whatever, just take a picture, send it to me, send it to your local AIS coordinator or, or DNR contact. We'll take a look at it. Uh, I get pictures from all over the, the region, really around the Midwest, people sending me pictures of plants, asking me what they are, uh, and I'm happy to do it. So um, please consider that an offer to you. If you have anything that you'd like identified, um, contact me or contact one of your local contacts and we can help you out with that. All right, European frog bit. This is another prohibited species. It's another one of these lily pad looking things. Uh, small floating plants. It has tiny lily pad like leaves. They're, they're about two inches across and kind of heart shaped. They have a swollen base here where the stem connects to the leaf, which is kind of like the water hyacinths uh, swollen base where it's just very buoyant tissue. And it's the idea is to keep it very high in the water column, uh, keep it floating and, and it's sort of resistant to getting weighed down by rain or by waves or anything else that might try to push the leaves down a little bit. It often grows in these backwater areas. You can see the background here is a lot of duckweed. And if the plant was not extremely buoyant, the duckweed might actually get pushed on top of the plant and shade out all the leaves. So it has a lot of buoyancy to try to keep it all the way at the top. It wants to be the plant on the top of everybody so that it can see the sun and nobody else can. So plants are always in competition like that for light. And this is the way that, that frog bit competes for light with these other species. This picture here is from Oneida Lake in um, uh, North Central New York. We were actually there looking for hydrilla and didn't know frog bit was there, but happened to find frog bit also. It was not documented in the lake at the time. So this one again has those little lily pad like leaves that are floating on the surface and then the flower is quite a bit different than a lily pad. It only has three petals that are circular with a yellow center. Um, again, very commonly sold in the water gardening trade, not sold anymore, illegal to possess or trade in Wisconsin or ship to Wisconsin, um, but it still could be out there. And it is established in Eastern Michigan. Uh, it is slowly moving eastward, but it's mostly in the Detroit area right now. And uh, I think in the Eastern UP as well. Um, not known anywhere too close to Wisconsin, but lower Michigan is not too far away and it could easily be moved on a trailer in the course of a day over that distance. You may have seen something that looks kind of like frog bit, and I'd say water shield is probably our native species that is most similar to frog bit. It has these small pads that are a few inches long, typically a football shape, and they don't have any notch in them. So the frog bit had that heart shaped leaf where it's, it's got kind of a notch in the top. Water shield doesn't. So it's just a continuous line all the way around the leaf in this, this elliptical or football shape to it. They turn lots of colors in the fall. So this is a late summer, early fall shot where there's, there's reds and there's yellows and there's greens in there. And water shield is most famous for the slimy coating that is on the bottom of the plant. It has a slime coating the stems and the underside of the leaves. And this is just a, a protective film on the, the plant to protect it from fungi, bacteria, things like that, that might try to attack the, the new foliage of the plant. It is, a, it is not something that comes off. So if you touch the plant, it's not like you got all this, this slime on your hands now. It stays on the plant. So uh, you don't have to worry too much about touching it. And I like to joke that when you snorkel through this one, you actually come out of the patch of water shield going faster than you went in. It's so slippery. It's really an interesting feeling when you snorkel through it without a wetsuit on. Uh, as it rubs on you, it's, it's really interesting. You'll have to try it sometime if you haven't already. All right, uh, brittle naiad is another prohibited species. This is one that would be moved by boats. It spreads by fragmentation. 
It intentionally does that. It has little spiny leaves that are opposite. And you can see here, there's pairs of them. There's one on the left and one on the right. And they have little teeth on them and typically curve quite a bit. They have a very arched appearance to the leaves. This helps them to hook onto other stuff and float around. So if a piece of this breaks off, they break very readily. That's where the name comes from, brittle naiad. These little clumps here tend to produce a bunch of seeds. At the ends of the stems, they produce seeds in the leaf axles. There's a tiny one sticking up here. There's one sticking up here and here. So these little seeds occur near the top. The tops break off and all of these little spiny hooked leaves can easily hook into another plant that's floating by or even some uh, a muskrat, for example, that swims through it, might get some stuck on its fur, um, anything, uh, a stick floating by. So they can hook onto something else and catch a free ride to some other part of the lake. If they get hooked onto a boat, they're very easily moved between lakes in the same way that Eurasian milfoil or any other species could be get moved around by fragmentation. And this one, as an annual, the seeds are pretty resistant to drying out. So the leaf material could dry out as the, a boat is driving down the road, but the seed may be left intact. And if it drops into another lake, then you have the seeds being essentially seeded right into the next lake. So where is this one located? It's a pretty unusual plant around the state. There's only a handful of locations, mostly in the southern part of the state and a couple in the central Wisconsin area. There are many other naiads that are native here. Uh, we have uh, most commonly slender naiad and um, southern naiad, which are the more common ones. And then spiny naiad is a, a fairly unusual one that's mostly in very hard water systems in the, the southeast part of the state. All the naiads are going to have opposite leaves and they're all annuals, but the spiny or the uh, brittle naiad, remember, has these curving leaves that have visible spines or teeth along each leaf. And our most common species is this slender naiad here that typically has pretty straight leaves and the leaves do not have any visible teeth. Unless you're looking with pretty high magnification, you won't be able to see any teeth on the leaves at all. So it's a very soft plant. It's uh, straight leaved and does not have teeth. This one here is debatable whether it's native or not. It is not considered invasive, but it, it may be uh, an introduced species introduced many, many years ago, a hundred or more years ago. Um, and interestingly enough, Minnesota considers this a special concern species, a rare native species. And uh, some people consider it introduced in Wisconsin and um, undesirable, but that's another topic. Yeah, the reason I put this on the slide is because it does have large teeth on the leaves, but what you notice is that it does not really curve. These are pretty flat leaves, pretty straight. So what you'd be looking for with the brittle naiad is the curving leaves that have teeth and that's really gonna give it away as the brittle naiad, the, the bad one, the only bad naiad that we're really concerned about. All right, now starry stonewort is one that arrived in the fall of 2000, I shouldn't say arrived, it was first documented in the fall of 2014 in Southeastern Wisconsin. It was our first population in Big, uh, Little Muskego Lake in uh, Waukesha County. And it was fairly well established there. So it, it did not arrive in 2014. It was probably a few years before that. The year after, in 2015 in the summer, it was found in central Minnesota, uh, a six or seven hour drive from Little Muskego Lake. So when that happened, we started wondering how many more lakes between central Minnesota and southeastern Wisconsin have starry stonework because obviously it got transported somehow from probably from Wisconsin into Minnesota. It's been moving e uh, westward from originally 
the Lake Ontario area in the uh, early 1970s. It's been moving westward ever since. And so it probably was in Wisconsin first and then eventually made it over to uh, Minnesota. So it's one that you should be on the lookout for in Northwest Wisconsin. It could be around and uh, just avoiding detection still at this point. So this one, the most obvious thing about starry stonewort is that it has these little star shaped structures in the sediments. They're called ball bills. It is usually only uh, four to eight millimeters across. So we're talking a little bit less than a centimeter. And uh, centimeters about, uh, there's two, about two and a half centimeters in an inch. So they're fairly small, but they look, they look like little white stars. They look kind of like the Michelin man, if you're familiar with that little cartoon guy. Uh, they're very puffy and typically have six of these little uh, arms on the star. There are no other species that are native to Wisconsin that produce little star-shaped structures in the soil. So if you see one of these, it is a starry stonewort. It is something we're, we're very concerned about, and you should make sure that you, you collect a sample or some photographs and send that into somebody for verification. The plant itself can be many feet tall. It can grow shallow, it can grow deep. It's not real picky about where it likes to grow. Typically it's in lakes that are fairly hard water systems. So if you're on a bog lake, you probably don't have to worry too much about starry stonewort showing up. But if you're on a lake that has a marl bottom, the, the soft gray muck on the bottom, or uh, you know you have hard water in your cabin or your house, uh, this, this is a species that could be an issue. So it's fairly tall, it's fairly wide. Here's the nickel again. You can see that this whirl of leaves here is many times the size of a nickel. It can be four or five inches across. So it's a pretty, pretty robust plant. And it will tend to hold its shape out of water. And each leaf or branchlet here as it comes out of the main stem tends to have this division here where uh, it's got this long, cell that develops where the reproductive structures are about to form here. And it's typically asymmetrical. So you'll see one where it divides here at the end, you'll see one that's quite a bit longer than the other one. And here it's actually on, on this leaf at the top, it's got a long leaf or branchlet here, and then many of these little bract cells, but these ones are, are shorter than the, the original leaf there. So that's really what you'd be looking for. But as I said before, you will not see anything else with white stars at the bottom of the plant. So if you see those, that's really a dead giveaway that it's starry stonewort and it's not anything else. So known distribution of this one, not in Northwest Wisconsin as far as we know, but again, it somehow made it from Southeast Wisconsin to central Minnesota over here. So it may have gone right through here. Uh, so it could be in your area and we just haven't found it yet. So mostly we're looking at southeastern Wisconsin. There's one in central Wisconsin now in Marquette County and then a bunch of populations were found in the Door County area in Green Bay and in Lake Michigan all at boat landings. So pretty clearly it'd be moved around by boats, could easily be moved from one location to another hopefully not in your area, but it's possible. Um, I think I had, all right, so I'll come back to that slender stonewort here in a minute. Uh, if you're interested in this one, on our Extension Lakes YouTube channel, I linked a couple of uh, brook trout presentations earlier during Kathy's talk to our Extension Lakes channel. Um, we have the channel on YouTube. It's free to watch any of these videos. We have an identification video for starry stonewort that compares it to some native species that look kind of similar. And, and we made this video about a year after starry stonewort showed up uh, based on some of the different species that had been sent to me where people said, I think this might be starry stonewort. I took all these, those species that were sent in and we included those in the video. So it helps people recognize here's a bunch of natives that look kind of like starry stonewort and are often mistaken for it. And we compare those to help people recognize starry stonewort and these other ones that, that look similar. 
So it is a native species to Europe, but actually an endangered species over there. It's very rare. And uh, it was first identified here in the St. Lawrence River and uh, probably early 70s is when it arrived through most likely ballast water discharge into the St. Lawrence Seaway. And it's been moving westward ever since. The, uh, the Caraceae family, which is the group that includes starry stonewort and uh, starry stonewort is, is nitilopsis. You'll see that word here on the slide. Nitilopsis obtusa is the Latin name for starry stonewort. Um, most of these, these Caraceae members, the Cara and the Nitella and other natives that look kind of like this, they tend to pre prefer specific depth ranges. This one usually does not. It, it can grow in a foot of water. It can grow in 15 feet of water. The control options are many. Uh, interestingly enough, in Wisconsin, we have been trying a different technique on pretty much every population in the state that's been managed. So different herbicides, different combinations of herbicides, hand removal, diver assisted suction harvesting boats, uh, suction dredging to dredge the sediment out and hopefully get those little stars out of the sediment as well. Everything has been approached a different way so that we can learn what works best on our Wisconsin lakes. Other locations like lower Michigan where they've been dealing with this for a decade or more, they really don't have a good answer at this point for treating this species. They've had a heck of a time trying to control it and um, the various herbicide treatments that they do on it routinely over there are called haircut treatments is what the, the trade calls them because they basically knock back the top and it comes right back. So it gives it a trim for a few weeks and then they have to do it all over again. In Wisconsin, our population that has been the most stable or even declining is the only population where we haven't done anything. And that is Pike Lake in Washington County. It's mostly state park land around the lake. And nothing has been done on the species for the what, five or six years that it's been documented there. And the population hasn't really done anything. Uh, I believe it's actually decreased a little bit. And many of these other populations that we're actually treating with herbicides and these different management techniques, those populations are actually increasing. So uh, really interesting how this plant is apparently just responding to the disturbance caused by the management and maybe doing nothing to this plant is, is a better option than, uh, than the different management techniques that we've tried. So a lot to learn about this species still. Uh, it's very interesting to watch these different populations and see how they're responding. So here's those, those ball bills again, the little stars that are produced. Here's a plant that I pulled up. This was actually in New York on one of the Finger Lakes. Uh, here's the starry stonewort. And then underneath in my hand here is some of the, the stars on these little filaments that are in the, the sediment in the soil under the lake. So there's a lot of ball bills potentially on one plant. It may have several dozen. Each one of these can produce multiple new plants as well. Uh, one of the most important things to remember about this species is that we don't have any female starry stonewort plants in the U.S., as far as we know. Uh, this is a plant where there is a separate male plant and a separate female plant, and each of them can clone themselves by fragmentation or by these ball bills. But unless you have both male and female present in the same lake, you don't have any sexual reproduction happening, so there's no uh, there's no seeds basically being produced by the plant. It's spreading by fragmentation only. So we're not worried that this plant is spreading by waterfowl or anything like that, because as far as we know, there's nothing here that could be consumed and then pooped out somewhere else, which is a common way that some aquatic plants get moved around by, by ducks and things. But in this case, anything that they ate and tried to move would be digested. It would not survive through a duck and it moves. So it's fragmentation, probably human caused uh, transport. That's really the, the to blame here. Um, I see a, I'm getting close to my time limit here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this and then I'll go back to that slender stonewort just to show a comparison with a native species. Uh, this is likely dispersed between uh, lakes by boats, as I said, 
anchors are probably a primary vector. So if you have an anchor that has a bunch of sediment on it and you're moving that muddy anchor to another lake, it very well could have starry stonewort ball bills. It could have snails in there. It could have other things as well. So you really wanna make sure you're cleaning anchors in particular between lakes. Uh, here's that native species, the slender stonewort that's kind of similar. It is a very delicate plant. You can see it's much smaller in diameter and it does not hold its shape out of water. So if you took it out of the water, it would flop over and just kind of collapse into a mass of green on your hand rather than um, still having those leaves sticking out. And it does not produce any ball bills. Um, I see a question in the chat about the genetics of the Minnesota and Wisconsin populations. Um, there is a study from the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center that looked at that and I believe that they showed that the population was from Wisconsin, uh, that the genetics matched up, that it was moved from Wisconsin to Minnesota, part of the same, uh, basically clones of the Wisconsin populations, yes. Um, so I think with, in the interest of time, uh, I will ask if there are any questions I will go through one more here if there are not questions. I think I have two more maybe, um, but it's okay if I don't get through one or two at the end. I wanna make sure that I can answer any questions um, as a higher priority than, than uh, covering these last couple here at the end. So I'll just wait a second to see if there are any questions come in and then I'll just start talking about this one. Yeah, uh, hi Paul, this is Zach Stewart from Douglas County. Um, I would chime in with a quick question. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for this talk. This is really great and I feel like I learned a lot. Um, my question uh, pertains to sort of the relative threat of some of these species. You know, when I'm talking with local stakeholders and, and lake association members, um, a common question will be, uh, you know, what are the effects and the negative impacts of a given species? And I think we all kind of get a little glazed over with just repeating sort of the stock impact, which many of these have, which is, you know, they form dense mats, they outcompete natives, and maybe they degrade the enjoyment of the beach or, or the um, navigability of the waterway. And I'm wondering if you have a little bit of a qualitative sense like out of the many species that you've introduced us to today, are there a couple that are that stand out as way faster spreaders or higher priorities than others, or are they fairly equal in their impact, in your opinion? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, these species definitely have different impacts because they, they grow in different ways. Some of these are floaters. Some of them are floating leaved, but rooted like this yellow floating heart. Some are fully submergent. So the impacts that they're gonna have on the system are different because of where they grow or how they grow, um, how much they're gonna shade out other things, what kind of impacts they might have on uh, oxygen penetration to the water or temperature or spawning habitats or things like that. Um, I would say that with all these species, we don't know their impacts in Wisconsin all that well because they haven't been here in any large quantity. Um, I can give an example of a, an interesting sequence of events that's happened with hydrilla in Florida. Uh, there was a population or, or many bald eagles were being found dead around, uh, I don't know if it was one lake or many lakes in Florida. Uh, but the, what actually was happening was that hydrilla had been introduced to a lake. Hydrilla is not harmful to bald eagles. They don't eat hydrilla, but hydrilla was, um, was harboring a toxic bacteria uh, called uh, Atuchthanos hydrilla I think is the Latin name for it. It probably doesn't have a common name. Most people don't commonly know bacteria, but the bacteria were then, uh, they were on these hydrilla plants and coots, small type of waterfowl, the coots were eating the hydrilla and the bald eagles were eating the coots. So the coots basically accumulated the toxins from these bacteria that were on the hydrilla that they ate. And they got, they developed these large uh, toxin concentrations in their tissues. And then the eagles were eating a whole bunch of coots and they were accumulating all those toxins. And eventually the toxins were so much that they would kill the bald eagles. Um, so that's an example where 
we didn't even think about that. We think about what kind of impact is it going to have as far as creating a dense mat that's going to outcompete other native plants? Okay, well, maybe that's not a big deal to some people, but there are these other effects, the ecological effects that this plant may have in a sequence that is eventually going to create some other problems. Um, to, to really get back to your question, Zach, uh, all of these plants can have very negative effects. They are all prohibited because they are considered kind of the worst of the worst. Uh, we know they spread extremely fast. They, they, in areas where they've been established, have caused a lot of problems with modifying the ecology of lakes and rivers. And uh, much of that is due to the things that you mentioned, the kind of the usual things that invasive species do. They outcompete other things. They reduce natives. They reduce biodiversity. They may have impacts on temperature and dissolved oxygen and water chemistry and things like that. And those are all really important things. Um, they shouldn't be downplayed. Uh, and, and the thing about all those things is they may have additional effects down the line that could be different with every species. And we just don't understand all of the effects that they may have. Great, thank you. Okay, with that, unless anyone has a quick question, we are at 1130. So thank you very much, Paul, for presenting today. If anyone was paying attention, the photos, I think all of them, or at least the majority of them are taken by Paul. He is an amazing photographer. And if anyone is interested in learning more about the plants around here, his book, Aquatic Plants of the Upper Midwest, is a very good guide. So thank you again, Paul, for presenting. And I'd also like to say thank you to all of our sponsors who are helping us out today. Um, and there will also be a follow-up survey. So we encourage everyone to take that survey. We do read the feedback, and we want to know how we can make this conference better for next year. So. Give Paul an applause or a thumbs up and thank you again.